Hey everybody, how's it going? Dan Schinder here on Drum Talk TV with our brand new original series called Under the Influence. I'm coming to you from Globe, Arizona, 100 miles east of Phoenix. And who would it be a better co-host for being under the influence than Lou Calderolo who's coming to us from Brewster, New York. We're like at opposite diagonal ends of the, the country here in the U.S. Lou, how's it going? Very, very good. Good. Excited to be here. How's everything out there? Really well. We're both experiencing some uh, hot and humid weather, right? And, uh, and folks, yeah. when I look over here, I'm not watching a hockey game or anything. I'm pulling up the show so that we could see your comments. So we want you to be part of this experience together. We'll explain what it's all about. You could you could see in the description, but we'll we'll lay it out there for you. Tell us where you're watching from, folks. And if you have musical or drumming influences, if you're a drummer, Go ahead and put that in the comments. If you have a link to a video of you playing music by your influences, put that in. And you could also submit for a chance to be featured on the show with Lou and I as well, if he decides he can put up with me after this. But anyways, <laughs> so here's the format of the show. We're each going to share different drumming influences. And we're going to kind of go back and forth. A couple of them probably even overlap. And, and be the same, even though I'm about 20 years older than Lou. But hey, my, my son Steve is in his 20s, and we have a lot of the same. Well, in fact, almost all of our musical tastes are the same. Um, but Lou, I'm sure, you know, like me, I know that you like many different genres of music. So you probably have a lot of different layers of different influences and for different reasons, right? Yeah. Who, yeah, who yeah. Who would be like two complete opposites? Hmm. Um, I guess, uh, let's see, right. Well, now, should I keep this off of today's list or can they be people from today's list? Ooh, that's a good question. You, you could keep it with today's list. We'll give them a sneak peek. Okay. Yeah. So I guess if I was going from that end, uh, here today, I would think potentially Gene Krupa coming from the earlier jazz style and, you know, the more of the old school and then, uh, flipping it over to, Neil Peart, where we're going into the progressive rock right. thing. So you got you got the the foundations and the jazzier side of thing on Gene's stuff, and then Neil from the prog rock and the real hammering rock drumming side. And what's so great about that example is that Gene was such a huge influence on Neil, which is awesome. But one of the reasons, folks, I wanted Lou to point this out is so that you can start to get an idea of who he is as a musician. And because he's done so many things and is always so busy, I can't memorize his introduction to give him a fair introduction. So I'm going to read from notes, something very rare on <laughs> Drum Talk TV. I mean, if you watch Drum Talk TV, you know there's no notes. Uh, so Lou Calderola is a longtime East Coast veteran of the music scene and a well-known session player and instructor. He is owner of the LAB Drum Lab Studio Acrylic Drum Project uh, page and currently teaches at School of Rock, Bedford, New York. Lou made his name uh, with original bands Soundscape and Kicksville. Love those names, by the way, Lou. Uh, as well as working with many others and works with the band Limelight, a tribute to Rush, the longest running Rush tribute band as a matter of fact, as well as, I love the name of this one too, Furious Bongo's Frank Zappa Tribute. Furious Bongo's Zappa Tribute. Uh, he has also worked with or made appearances with such artists as Brian Titchy and the Randy Rhodes Remembered Shows, uh, Papa Chubby and others. And now, to add to his resume, he's on Drum Talk TV. And we featured you over the years many times. Yeah, you guys have been uh, incredibly supportive. I appreciate it. It's so great to finally join you live, too, because you've done so much sharing uh, on some of the little projects and, and, and clips and things that we've done with the acrylic project and other things over the years. Awesome. Well, it's my pleasure. Um, so I'm going to kick it off so that Luke can kind of get the feel and also because I've got a video queued up that would be difficult to find again, quite honestly. <laughs> so one of my biggest influences and if you follow drum talk tv folks and you watch my dan's almost daily vlog shows that i do not even almost daily anymore about once a week ish and i'm going to get back to doing them more often having some stuff done on my hands um i you, you know i've i'm old school i'm old so i'm old school 
go figure. But not old at heart. Just, I've got a lot of miles on me, okay? Phil Collins is one of my biggest influences, not only stylistically, not only the music that he's made, that he made with Genesis going way back to the early 70s. And a lot of people don't know this, Lou. I don't know if you do or even how much of a Phil fan you are, but Phil was Genesis's fourth drummer very early on. A lot of people don't realize that. But Phil forever played with open bottom heads. And some people who don't know this about me often will comment during a live and say, how come there's no rezzo heads? And it's because that's not my sound. It's not that I don't like the way those drums sound or like what or don't like what other drummers have done with that. I just prefer Neil Peart had concert toms. Phil Collins always had concert toms for a very long time. Carl Palmer had concert toms. Um, Alan White had North drums mixed in with his kit. I could go on and on. And that's just my, my brain is stuck in that time zone of sound and it just works for me. Um, so Phil Collins, huge influence. And I picked out a video that I did three years ago when we did a live show with Dr. Nadia Azar, who was here in person at our studios measuring um, my heart rate and calorie burn. That's one of the research studies she did with uh, uh, partnering with the University of Windsor, Canada, where she is a professor of kinesiology. And people, so Lou, if you didn't see that and folks who didn't see that, I'd say okay, we did three days. A day of Zeppelin, a day of Rush, and a day of uh, Prague Epics. And I'd play for about 45 minutes or so, and people would guess how many calories I burned and what was the closest to my heart rate, and whoever came the closest would win something. So I dug up some videos from those. And folks, you'll see, other than this first one, no, I'm wrong. This first one is from that. So my set looks a little different than it has looked for the last two and a half years. This has fewer things set up with it, but absolutely works for the fill uh, demonstration. So this is a, a short excerpt of a long Genesis medley. I'm including a nice instrumental part of Cinema Show into Valley of Slipper Men, and then it ends just as it goes into uh, Afterglow. And after we all watch this together, um, Lou can grill me as far as why is that meaningful to you? Why is that an influence? What is up with that? And we'll kind of play that that opposite host with each other. Here we go, for it, folks. Dig it. <laughs>
get the idea. <laughs> so, um, wow. Uh, in watching that and listening to it, uh, my hands hurt. I've been having some nerve issues <laughs> with my hands and I don't think I could play that like that, like right now. Um, I've been kind of gingerly choosing when I play and how often I play because of my hand issues and that hurt just to watch, <laughs> but it, it's one of my favorite, one of my probably top three, th <laughs> one of my top three or four things to play ever. That's hard. I shouldn't have opened that can of worms up. <laughs> it's so true. Like the tri so like the parts are so like triumphant and energetic sounding, you know? Yeah. And, and that's my favorite version of that medley. I, I think, I'm trying to remember what year that one was from. Um, and I don't think it was their 2007 return tour. I think it was one before that. I, I'm not sure. I don't know. It wasn't 2007 because they didn't go into Valley of Slipperman. They added something different in there. But but yeah, that that's uh, one of my biggest influences right there. And one of my favorite things to play by him and i think it shows a very wide breadth of his skills you know he was in brand x which was a fusion band his heart is with old school rhythm and soul and r b rhythm and blues as well and and this is just so out there with some other you know the off times and the the different speeds and tempos I, it's just a little bit of everything and i think that's why i like it now was it with phil was it that mix of all of that that really caught your attention like with some of my drummer influences you know sometimes you you get drawn to someone like oh wow their grooves and their their construction of parts is what caught my attention with other folks it's the way they you know tear around the kit or do their fills that maybe grab your attention first what what was it about phil overall that drew you in right away that's a great question i think when i first heard him it was on Seconds Out, which is live, and of course also has uh, Chester Thompson playing drums on some of it, and then there's a cuts, couple cuts from the tour before that with Bill Bruford. So I had to learn, like, I was young too, I was like 14, and I had to learn, okay, wh where's Phil playing? Okay, I get it now, I understand. And then I dove into their material, and I, I think it was the, the vastness of the different types of things one drummer was doing and it really opened my mind to not be in one box and that's okay if someone's in one box you know like i see speed metal drummers that are and i can't even fathom how they're physically doing it and if that's the only right. thing they're doing <laughs> i don't take points away because i can never do that or get my head around it but for me, it was the the vastness of the versatility and dynamics. Dynamics was a huge thing, too. That's a great one. That's great. Yeah. Well, what's one of your biggest ones? And then I'll pull up that video after you talk about All right. the person and give a little introduction. Um, I guess uh, I guess I'll start at the beginning for me, where as a kid, who made me first notice drums and go, oh, <laughs> that's something that I want to do, and that's that's going to be Mooney, the Madman. Um, uh, and that uh, like I can even uh, funny like certain things you get those occasional memories from from childhood where something super specific sticks with you, and it happens to be a moment I can <laughs> I can remember driving, sitting in the passenger seat of my dad's very very obnoxious yellow ford pinto <laughs> and um we, and he you know my parents it was awesome my parents were those folks though neither of them played music they always had music on in the house it was yeah. always so there was always music playing so whether it's the car whether it's the house always music so i can remember i i geez, i had to be three or four and the usual routine going with dad and he's got the radio on and i heard boris the spider oh. and um you know, not that, that not that that's even one of Keith's craziest songs, but um, I heard Boris the Spider, and as a kid, it was the music was neat. You had that funky vocal, you know, that the deep vocal, yeah. and oh, they're singing about a spider. I thought that was the coolest thing, and but I remember the I noticing the drums, and soon after that, bugging mom and dad for you know your kids' practice kit, and kind of went from there. But yeah, Keith was the person that 
made me notice the drums. And then when I got into music more, seeing, you know, seeing his playing and watching, you know, seeing the things like the Smothers Brothers clips and uh, watching all of that stuff, you know, the kids are all right film. And it's just, he was just so fun to watch. Yeah. And see him, you know, monster, go monstrous on the kit. <laughs> yeah, he was so animated in the way he played. He was yeah. never laid back, not even for the simplest parts, you know. It was right? so much yeah. motion, you know. I wonder if he got that from Gene Krupa. Yeah, it was always interesting watching those even before they, you know, when he was in the earlier videos, when he would still play like a five piece kit, yeah. he still had that motion, go, yeah. you know, and it was just so interesting how he was doing all that movement, but the playing still seemed fluid yeah. in, in that manner. Yeah, and it was and also go Mooney. Yeah, <laughs> right. He was just, you know, going for it and it worked. And I think he was also the drummer, you know, with my connection to acrylics. I think he was the first drummer. I mean, Bonham's acrylic kit is the one everybody knows. But I think Keith was the first time I noticed acrylics because he had that big clear kit, com you know, complete with goldfish. Yeah, <laughs> and that might have been before Bonham. Definitely. Um, Billy Cobham had a clear fives kit yeah. before Bonham. Yeah. Because that was Mahavishnu days in the earlier 70s. Bonham's was used for the first time in 73, the amber kit. And he, they only made that color for him. They only made that color for him. And there were two of them. And one of them, everything was two inches bigger. One of them had the the the... Back in my day, we called it a hang tom. The rack tom, even though it's not on a rack, was bigger. <laughs> and then he had an 18 and a 20 instead of a 16 and an 18. But that that one color was made for him. And it's such the classic, you know, most folks, I think, uh, you know, associate that with your acrylic shell is it's amber, right? You know, that right, is, that's exactly. the classic. Yeah, exactly. So on the Keith Moon, Maybe I could skip past the very beginning. We could take a chance with it a little bit. Or we can maybe even if we want to reference just something using Zach. That's the tough you know, thing, folks, is finding some great stuff of Keith we can use isn't always easy. <laughs> yeah, because we can't broadcast stuff that's an official release um, because the algorithm will hear it. And we had something that we thought was not official. It was supposedly a bootleg version where the drums were taken out, but it must have been from an official release because it did get muted when we posted the promo. Um, but I don't have anything to pull up from Zach. Okay. So, but uh, but it's great to hear that influence. So give us an, I happen to know of at least a couple more that we do have videos of. If you want to move on mm -hmm. to your next influence, we'll show that. Yeah, and I'll I'll kind of I'm going to kind of go somewhat chronologically for me. Um, you know, Moon there obviously made me maybe notice things, and you know, I I started getting into rock stuff, but also at the time, you know, this would be you know early to mid seventies and all. Um, my folks, a lot of times it was rock, but they also listened to a lot of classic stuff, like you know, with big band music. Motown was big in my house. Um, some of the first songs I can remember hearing as a kid were Motown stuff. Um, but going back on the other side, they, my, they would listen to big band a bit. And then that, I just thought it was cool ha having like your core band, but all the horns and everything and those big, you know, ensembles and, and you'd see sometimes the old films that featured those bands and that um of course um um i'm gonna get points off on this one because i can't remember the name of the film but the the film with that featured gene krupa on drums um and some great you know some great footage of him playing and yeah. that i remember seeing that as a kid and about oh, this guy look at him wow this is crazy this guy's yeah. going crazy on the drums yeah. and so krupa was one of my big uh, other, I mean, you know, uh, there's the tie-in, of course, Buddy Rich is, yeah. you know, Buddy's Buddy. Yeah. Um, but I think be being a Keith Moon fan, Gene Krupa kind of reminded me of like, hey, this kind of seems like the predecessor to Keith. He's kind of a crazy man back there yeah. behind the kit. Exactly. Where Buddy was just killing it like a professional all the time, very seriously. Yeah. Keith. And, you know, Keith and Gene Krupa to me were more like the Mad Men behind the yeah, kit. Yeah, more flamboyant in their playing and, and just their persona was totally different. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So who would that be? 
Gene? That, so, yeah. Yeah, Gene, you know, I would say Krupa is my, you know, the, my next evolution there before I got into all our modern modern guys, which we'll, we'll, get, we'll get to covering soon. Yeah. <laughs> but do I have a Gene clip from you? I don't think I do. Yeah, we did. Yeah, we we had that one that we did able to. Uh, if you still have it, we were able. To, it was a clip from uh, from the film, actually. Oh, a little that, black and white clip. That's right, and that we couldn't use. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, because it's from the film. All right. Yeah, yeah. Because you, you said we had something that was possible, but we weren't sure if that was going to fly. Yeah, I'm sorry. I I thought I told you. Sorry. Let's move on to another one of yours. Maybe the one. Oh, okay. That's... You want me to, or do you want to yeah. take your second no, guy? Go for it. I, I want to play a, a video of uh, either you or something that's an influence of you, and we have both. Oh well, yeah. We'll go on, like um, going semi chronologically for me, and one that you guys have helped me and shared a, a bit as well. Bonzo, uh, John Bonham. I mean, that was him. someone. Yeah, yeah, someone who just. How do you not, as a rock player, uh, you know, understand how much he's done exactly. for us rock drummers and, uh, you know, getting into, the, you know, the beauty of his his the acrylic kit, his drum parts, his solos, the uh, song remains the same film. There's just so many great things. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, let that, he, he just, Keith and, and Krupa turned me into a drummer. And then I think Bonham, was the person that made me go, Oh, it groove. And you know, really, yeah. Fills are great. Being a madman is great too, but wow, the groove and the feel and the yeah. power that he had uh, behind things, you know, it was just, that was really what kind of set the standard then and really put me on the path to the drummers that influenced me from there on out. Definitely. And as you know, with my acrylic drum project, being a big fan of the acrylics, yeah, we did a big thing featuring a lot of today's modern acrylics. Most um, we work with RCI and wanted to show how good acrylics can sound because sometimes they got the reputation of being only loud drums, but not the best sounding drums. And a lot of folks, wow. Romano Catone at RCI's, really perfected getting them down where they sound beautiful. So we put a bunch of my friends, Sal and Brian. Uh, Sal Gonza and Brian Duke joined me in the room and we did a big tribute and but a moment of that tribute features a bunch of Bonham's licks yeah, which you guys that, have shared for us break that down so people can see if they can pick them out when we play the video in a moment who's playing what licks and groups okay so um so we've got my friend Sal Gonza is uh, he plays an amber kit um and no, no, notice Sal, Sal is, uh, and myself, I'm a lefty on a right-handed kit. Sal is also a lefty on a right-handed kit, but you'll notice he sets his kit up to reflect his left-handedness a little bit more than I do. Mm. Um, Sal's covering some stuff on the amber. We all join in and we pay a little tribute with levy breaks. Um, Sal uh, will give us some mentions of the ocean, uh, jumps over to myself in the middle on my Coke bottle greens, and uh, a little bit of fool in the rain and brian duke um is on the red and brian's kit is all spec to the exact sizes of bonhams as well you'll oh, notice his kits his kits the, the, the sizes and everything yeah. oh. and uh he reflects some of black dog oh nice so here we go folks check this out this is lou and company the acrylic project with a tribute to John Bonham, Bonzo being one of Lou's biggest influences. Here we go.
love it. For those of you who don't know, I'm sorry, what's the gentleman's name in the red again? Brian Duke. So what Brian's doing there, in case you don't know, with Black Dog, is on the Song Remains the Same version, the 1973 tour, it didn't come out till 76, That those versions of those years... John was doing a lot of extra bass drum work. It's, and I love that he threw that in there. That's that's kind of a deep cut for those who really know the live stuff, you know. Um, that was cool. Those kits are beautiful and they do sound great. That must have been fun to do. It was. And we did it, if, if you notice in the videos too, we kept it very simple. We used, um, we just used the old school miking technique kick snare and an overhead yeah. on each kit you know we didn't go crazy it was just this was all about hey folks you know acrylic kits can look cool but sound really good too right. um you know don't don't go by the old standards of oh they just they're just loud right. you know they, they've right. really perfected um the the use and sound of acrylic shells these days and you know what lou there's, there's certainly a way to consciously and scientifically build louder drums because the harder the surface, I love when it's cold. My drums sound best when they're cold. The harder the surface, the louder they're going to be. The more dense the surface, the louder they're going to be. But I think it's also up, the responsibility has to be on the drummer as well to make loud drums not sound as loud as they <laughs> need to be. I mean, that, you know, I think that that, and it takes more effort when you're playing with drums that are naturally loud, whether it's size or material or heads or whatever. So let's... yeah. Let's stay with John Bonham uh, as the theme, and I'm going to play an excerpt of me playing one of my favorite Zeppelin songs, and I love this for the odd syncopation. This is a, if you don't know the song well enough as a dancer, you could definitely throw your hip out trying to dance to this one. <laughs> this is from the Presence album, which came out in 76, um, and it's Nobody's Fault But Mine. I saw this tour and like you, it was John Bonham that made me go, oh, it was, it was, I had heard Led Zeppelin music. I had posters all over my room, but this was the first concert I went to. My dad took me. I was 14. I was all set to be an oceanographer. I had my life planned out. By the third song of this concert, I realized, oh, and this was the third song, by the way, I realized, oh, you mean this could be a job? <laughs> And there went oceanography. I haven't looked back since. So <laughs> here we go with nobody's fault but mine. Some of it. Not going to run everybody into the ground with the whole thing. Here's some of my favorite stuff from it. <laughs> There you go. 
<laughs> That's a fun one to play. That took me a long time to learn. I learned that I was probably 15 and played it in a band, and it was that that crazy bun, ka, bun, ka, ba, 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 bun, ba, ba. that whole part was like ka. And now it's like <laughs> muscle memory, you know. <laughs> um, do you want to go with? Well, I don't want to give them away, but uh, I will say this. Here's my hint to you: you have something no one has seen, and it's of a video that you were present for that was a rehearsal for something yes. that maybe everyone has seen. Uh -huh. that, yeah, they've probably seen the, the final product, but uh, not too many people have seen the rehearsals. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. I do. Before we get to that, do I have one question for you on the oh, bottom? Oh, yeah, thing. yeah. Sorry. What was it? What was it like to be in the arena with him live playing in front of you? You know, for my first concert, and like I say, my walls and ceilings were ceilings. I had one ceiling that I remember. It was all <laughs> flat. You could see no paint. And it was all Led Zeppelin, Yes, Jethro Tull, Pink Floyd. And I think that's it. ELP. And to then, so what was weird is, think of what a concert poster looks like. You see the players and you see the lights and everything else is black. Well, when we walked into the arena, it was, was at the LA Forum. Um, it like all the lights are on and here's this stage and you see the instruments, but it just looked weird because the lights were on, you know? And I was kind of <laughs> like, oh, this isn't what I thought it was going to be. Like, I didn't know what to make of that even though I had performed in school performances before, but not with the lights off and a light show and all that, you know? So that was weird. But then when the lights went off and flash bulbs are going and they're just da -dun, da -dun, tippy tapping before they start. And then uh, Jimmy hit the first chord of the song remains the same. When the lights went on, I'm getting goosebumps now. I did not take a smile off my face for over three hours. It was just, <laughs> on freaking real and we had great seats we were sitting like at the five o'clock position on jimmy's side halfway up the loge had a great diagonal view of everything and there he was he was right there oh i even have pictures i took that's them playing battle forevermore that's awesome so that's the angle i had but from a little farther away that was with the zoom lens that's a pretty good seat yeah, and I have, I think, uh, I don't want to, ah, here we go, no quarter. This is from our seats. Wow, very cool. So, you don't see, yeah, you don't see too many, you know, individual shots of classic bands like that, that nobody's ever seen that picture before, then. you know? Yeah, exactly. So it was, it was quite interesting to say the least. And it, it like I said, it had a life path changing effect on me because i really thought i was going to be the next jacques cousteau um, <laughs> yeah crazy so uh, you mentioned uh you mentioned a rehearsal yes, um yeah so yeah i um i'll quickly get set that up as i fortunate enough through my time with school of rock you know and and other music stuff getting you never know who you're going to connect with in our world right and um, I was fortunate enough through School of Rock to get close with Paul Schaefer and his family. They're the tremendous family. They're awesome. And Paul gave me the opportunity to get involved with Drum Solo Week at the Letterman Show. And um, I got to sit with them and pick out, well, who, who are we going to book for week number two? And, um, and it all came, a long story for a different time, but the reason I got this opportunity is because he wanted me to come and see Neil perform, and I couldn't make it that day. Oh, so what could I have possibly <laughs> gotten in the way? Oh, you know, that, okay, that's a long okay, story. Sorry, it's, sorry. A, <laughs> I don't put you on the spot. it's a long, silly story that I still regret. Oh, um, <laughs> But yeah, so he, Paul, being as awesome as he is, wanted to make it up to me. So I was like, hey, why don't you book four drummers for us for week two? He's like, but there's a catch. You got to pick a drummer 
that I'm not that aware of and really blow my socks off. So oh, wow. being that I had been recently listening to this gentleman and appreciating his work with uh, with Porcupine Tree, my I, it took me about two seconds to turn to Paul and say, Gavin Harrison. And uh, I just, what Gavin's, I think he's the modern innovator of rock drumming. I think he's the guy that's taking things to a level we, we haven't, quite seen in some aspects um just the way he his smoothness and his creativity and his parts just yeah. it's just through the roof for me i i i've been completely mesmerized watching him play terrific guy um he's let me come and see some rehearsals you know since then from this connection but i was able to get rehearsals here when he was practicing with letterman my cousin and i were two of the maybe four or five people sitting there watching the band rehearse that day. So we did, uh, we recorded, he took three rehearsal passes of the chicken with the band before they filmed for the show that night. Each rehearsal pass, his solo was a little bit different, but basically he, he had a pretty good format that he stuck with. And uh, that's one of the things that I was able to get you a, a clip of one of the rehearsals. This is rehearsal pass number two that, that you're seeing a clip from. And it's different, folks, from what you've seen broadcasted. Like Lou said, this is a different pass of them playing that song. So no one's ever seen this before, as far as we know, right? Yeah, as far as I know, except a couple of us on the iPhone. <laughs> right, right. Uh, so let me find that clip. It is right. Here it is. Ready, folks? Check this out. just so cool to see that that's great what was that like being that close and seeing him doing that really really fun Three uh, times. i was <laughs> yeah i mean not knowing um i had only got we gotten a chance to speak with him really briefly before i, I mean i'd seen him play I, I couldn't say other than a little correspondence we didn't meet until that day and we spoke a few minutes before and uh, you know afterwards he spent some time with us got to you know check a check out the kit and tour the kit and all but it was really interesting watching that because we spoke backstage. We, we went and took those seats right up front by the cameras. The band and them took their spots and they started playing and we're watching and he's doing all these interesting movements and tricks. And we're like, what in the heck is he doing there? What the heck is that? It was just one thing after another. Yeah. The tube in the floor, Tom, we're like, well, what? You might have even heard us say something to each other when he's doing that there. Um, it was really, really fun to watch. Um, it was just so much more of a, an interesting, innovative solo than we even expected it to be. And such a, you know, a humble, great guy, you know, made, made sure we got a tour of the kit and all, sent me a, you know, wonderful care package for doing the Letterman show and all. And oh, yeah, just nice. what a great, what a, you know, what a great guy. So happy to see him getting even more and more attention. Cause I really, you know, Gavin is just, uh, think he's like i said taking things to another level with the with this type of drumming and progressive and hard rock drumming yeah while being very musical at the same time and i know yeah. some people don't like that term but i believe that it's appropriate yeah and Not if you see like even musical right lou Right. Well, yeah. And his like, but, you know, like you say, very musical where he's taken a lot of the porcupine tree stuff and some of these other material and reimagined it for big band jazz and done those recordings. Yeah. So, you know, he's not just a pounder, you know, right. I mean, he, he got all sides of it. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great one. 
Um, let's switch to one, another one of mine. Um, yeah. Okay, so Carl Palmer has been a huge influence of my I interviewed him recently about a month ago again. Um, just a really great role model as a drummer and a professional musician. And that band that I played Nobody's Fault But Mine in, for a while we had a keyboard player. And when we did, we played Carnival 9. So I learned that when I was like 15. Like it was one thing to be able to put on a record, listen to it, and know how it goes. But to physically learn stuff like that at that age, when I think back, uh, what was I putting myself through? But I was able to do it. I was the youngest one in the band. And um, so I decided when I thought, okay, Carl Palmer, that's one of my choices. What am I going to play? I love so many things that he's done. So it kind of honestly came down to what did I have within arm's reach and the time to put this together? And it just happened to be Carnival 9. So I picked out a section of Carnival 9, first impression that's near the beginning. And here's a fun fact for people who are ELP fans or not, and may even be a surprise to some ELP fans. Carnival 9, first impression, part one on the album is sung by Keith Emerson. Greg Lake sung part two of first impression, but Keith, to my knowledge, never sung it live. Greg always sung it from the beginning of part one. So a little fun fact there. So here we go. Uh, give me some slack. After all, I'm trying to emulate Carl freaking Palmer, okay? Let's see how this goes. I want to remember how it goes. <laughs> just to hear that oh, great stuff thanks it's another one of my very favorite things to play um i heard it for years before i ever tried to play it i, I had older cousins that exposed me to a lot of the stuff that came out in the 60s and the early 70s so when i learned that to actually learn it to play it 
um, I would have been, that would have been 1978. Yeah, I would have been 15. Gave that away. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, to, to really immerse yourself into learning how to play something that you only knew audibly as a music fan, like, oh, this is a great song, I love it. But then to pull it apart and put it under a microscope, and I'm, I'm real anal about that. Like, I want to get everything in the right place with the same technique and this, you know what I mean? I'm not saying I do it, but that's my, how I approach it. And I do my best to replicate it that way. I don't want to do my own interpretation. Oh, I'm not able to do that. So I'm going to do it a different way. I do it until I can do it. And, and what drew me to that song uh, or really, well, the, the other guys who wanted to play it in the band, but I mean, part of the appreciation of that song is it's like running through a maze as fast as you can. Every time you turn, there's something different, <laughs> but yet it makes sense. You know, it's just still a, right. a composition that's, you know, makes sense. Um, so I just love it. I love that piece for three people. That band was just phenomenal. I mean, what they put out between the three of them, you know, just amazing musicians. Yeah. There's some of those things that like with Carl's stuff that I always noticed when I was younger was just like his snare drum work. Like yeah. just like, Oh, oh my God. Yeah. yeah. And, and his cowbell, like, I think he was the rock drum. I mean, you know, we, we know the other guys that are famous for cowbell, but I think Carl was the guy that made me notice rock cowbell. You know I, I mean? I it used it enough. Yeah. And I almost used that section of that song Oh, where it goes, do 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 and then the guitar solo comes in, do 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 because it's he's basically doing tick 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 tick, you know, this like almost yeah. paradiddle kind of thing through all that. And if if you don't concentrate and get the motor skills, that is so easy to take that off the rails, over the cliff, tumble <laughs> down, end up in the gorge, get washed away by the river. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's like, ah, ah. <laughs> but I love that. That's, that's what I like to do. I love the challenge. Like, can I do that? I don't know. Let's figure it out. You know, Yeah. I hear what he's doing. Now I got to teach my physical part, how to do it. The understanding it is one thing physically doing. It's another, they're two different things. And I love that about the drums, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's always been the, my, you know, you can notice with a lot of my influences too are some of the busier or the progressive guys. And same, I, I've always liked the challenge. Heck, hey, I, you know, of course, I love to sit that back and hold a great groove behind a good song as well. But the things that I always enjoyed and gravitated towards were the, the challenges. Like, can I do that? Can I figure that out? And, you know, odd time signatures, challenging parts. And those were the things that always really drew me to the drums yeah. as well. That's cool. And it, it shows in your influences. So someone else who's also very focused on the details is my son, Stephen, our associate producer of all our live presentations and does a lot of other things beyond the scenes of drum talk TV. He's texting me saying, Steve, if you don't mind, because maybe someone out there can help us. He says, is that true, Keith, saying in that song, I can't find anything on that? And I wrote, I said, I believe it's on the album credits that way. He says, can't find anything. Oh, but then he says, oh, I see, he did the computer voice. So he's referring to the computer voice in third impression. But Steve, I'm pretty sure, and I'm okay if I'm wrong. I'll be the first to say, oops, I'm remembering you're <laughs> wrong, or I smoked one that day. I don't know. But I seem to remember on the album credits or somewhere, it, Keith is credited for singing that first half, the, the part one of the first impression. Maybe I'm wrong, but I've remembered it that way for years. Um, so I don't know if someone else out there can help us, but Steve, keep digging and let me know. I promise I'm not just making shit up, though. This is just the way I remember it, even if I remember it wrong. So, Lou, another influence you'd like to grace us with. There's so another sure, one if you I'm and gonna... I share. And I, I have an example of that person, too, but I'm going to let you go first with yours, and I'll explain why afterwards. All right. I'm going to go here with, you know, I um, kind of said I'm working towards, you know, my – my bigger ones there, like Gavin Harrison, I discovered in more recent years, but 
if I'm getting two for five that we've picked today, my my biggie, um, you know, the, the hero status there would have to be the professor, uh, Neil Peart. Um, obviously, I wouldn't have probably been in a 20-year limelight rush tribute That's if I crazy. didn't have a little influence. Years, um, most- there have been some other bands that have been playing about as long, but we've, it's the same, you know, same, four, there are four of us, you know, we do have a singer who, as you know, sounds uh, uncannily Amazing. like the early Getty. Um, so there are the four of us and it's been us four pals. We've known each other many, many years and we've been doing, we're going into our 21st year coming up on limelight so yeah neil was the guy that just showed me wow drums can be a musical and upfront instrument too they don't have to just be the ba- the guy right. in the back holding down the groove not to say that these other drummers we've talked about only sat in the back uh it's just right. at the time it was in i was in like the sixth or seventh grade i had heard some rush songs like i knew Fly by night. I knew closer to the heart. Like I knew those things you'd hear on the radio a little bit, but it wasn't until like the sixth or seventh grade when I had some friends who said, "Well, Lou, you're a drummer," and they handed me the cassettes and said, "Listen to Moving Pictures and listen to Permanent Waves." Those were the two albums that I was first exposed to. So Rush had already they were Rush already, um, but that's when I heard them. Went, oh, oh my, and it really redefined my entire musical direction. And then I. That was that was where I went, you know, down the rabbit hole, so they say. And yeah, Neil is, you know, Neil has been my drumming hero for for you know ever since I heard those songs back in the sixth or seventh grade. Uh, my buddy Seth, Seth, thank you for handing me that that cassette back <laughs> that, in the day. That, that's a great setup. Um, check this out. This is from. I'm going to spoil it. It's from 2112, and it's a drum cam, so you can't hear the other instruments that well. So turn it up, turn it up. I (laughs) promise it'll be worth it. Check this out. Just uh, curb language, freaking superb! It re- <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, the drumming, the band, um, as a as a pretty much lifelong Rush fan, I could so appreciate that. And it's funny because Neil is one of the ones I picked out. Folks, we chose five. We didn't talk about it. And Neil is also one of the ones I picked out. And the first clip i chose before you sent me that is i had an excerpt of me playing 2112 so when i got yours i thought no i gotta change mine up um, <laughs> so before we get to my neil clip um how long of a show do you guys do talk about the band a little bit how long of a show you do what do you cover one part of their catalog do you go from 2112 to clockwork Angel? like what's the deal so primarily, um, as you can hear with with our singer um, Rob Jackson, uh, Rob's voice 
kind of is that a he loves that style of of their that era of rush and he just he really does it so well um our focus is from the first album to signals okay but we do um we do sporadic songs afterwards you know we we have some stuff from snakes and arrows distant you know uh we do distant early warning we got nice. you know big money and there are songs from after that but our focus is that more classic 70s and 80s rush um a typical show um we do we kind of have two main lineups when it's usually like an evening with limelight kind of thing where we structure it a bit like a rush show it's usually two 70 minute sets maybe a little bit longer depending right. it's usually an average two hour long to 70 minute sets um and then maybe a, a little encore um uh, but then we have like this your streamline show if it's usually us and a couple other tributes where like you saw or like that's if from you're, a, if you're doing a wedding or bar mitzvah exactly yeah when we you know you know when we're doing you know the, the children's <laughs> party and we streamline it a little um that's usually like a 90 minute set which um you know when you when you put in the, the you add up those things you know the classics you know you we got to do tom sawyer you got to do you know spirit radio subdivisions close once you put a handful of those songs together you're like oh wow we've already done 65 70 minutes worth of music and then you pick a couple extras to round out the show yeah. so it's usually either a 90 or two 65 70 minute shows there and yeah rob jackson eric strom and steven schnaper that's my buddies who've been with me all along and we're located in the new york connecticut area but we've traveled all about we've done the rush con up in canada three separate times and nice. we haven't made it all the way to the west coast yet yeah what the um, hell, but we've man? done all around <laughs> we've been you know traveling around as much as we can um, so many great Rush tributes out there, though, too, as well. I mean, we know yeah. a lot of the other guys. And uh, our big our big thing for us, our big, you know, what have we felt one of our big points is is Rob's voice to, and the ability to do that classic old stuff the way he does. Yeah, he does a great job. My first exposure to Rush was I was 13, and um, my mom drove and picked this friend of mine up to come back to my house and he had an album in his hands 2112 and before even hearing it we're in the car and I open it up and there's those three guys and I'm thinking to myself what's with the kimonos like just the whole vibe <laughs> of the thing and the cover I like I couldn't wait to hear it and I think my mouth just kind of hung open in curiosity listening through 2112 and then you got, you know, almost a handful of regular sort of songs. You got Passage <laughs> to Bangkok, um, Lakeside Park. Is that on? No. That's Caress of Steel. But yeah, yeah so you got. So you got. Yeah, but you, you know. Wow, I can't even remember now because I was. So Lessons, busy. Tears. That's right. Passage. Lessons, tears, Passage to Bangkok. And there was one other. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, now, um, um, now we're all going to get in trouble here because I'm drawing a blank as well. <laughs> oh, we're gonna, we're, we'll give something away, everybody. Oh, else. something for nothing. That's oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which they closed out the first live album with. I loved that song. Um, so in that band again, when I was 15, they wanted to do 2112. Um, and we played a handful of other songs. So I learned that one early. But when you sent me your clip of 2112, I said, I, there's no way that's just way too good. I'm not going to play my stupid clip thanks very much so, yeah so we played some other stuff and one of my favorite favorite rush things to play and had fun learning the learning process was fun was la villa strangiato so i'm gonna play a little bit of that where is it there it is i'm gonna play a little bit of la villa strangiato and um again the condition my hands are in right now i don't know if i could play it this well not that it's great great but um i have got some nerve damage i'm dealing with and a friend of mine is the most uh, sought after hand surgeon in the country he's in scottsdale arizona he also has a supplement brand and he said take these for a month and your hands should be like 80 percent better and it's actually not only helped my hands my blood sugar's been down i'm diabetic 
And it, he said, oh, yeah, it'll help with that, too. Because I called him. I said, hey, my numbers are down. Does this have anything to do with <laughs> what you gave me? Because it's the only thing I'm doing different. So I'm working through it. But again, this is one of those very challenging songs that is challenging in two ways. Dexterity and memory. There's a lot yeah. of different little things to memorize in this short little segment. I'm going to play from La Vila Stranciato. So here we go. Right here. sloppy what? rendition of uh maybe the most challenging part of la vila strangiato including that whole middle break that features alex that when i first started learning the song or, or and i don't know if i heard it before no i had heard it before i the album came out and then they said let's do this and i was like wait what and all those rolls and the zippity zap knickknack pedagogic all that stuff was like didn't even phase me as, okay, I got to learn that. I was like, okay, I've been playing Carnival 9. I'll learn that. But that beat, yeah. I was like, wait, I don't know if I can 
like I didn't even know the words limb independence then, but I didn't know if I could get my body. That took me a while to get. And I love that's a wacky that. part. It is, especially because you have to also come way down. You got all that energy and then you got to just do that. <laughs> and it's like it's going from being bombastic on timpani drums to just carefully playing the triangle, you know. Right. Yeah. What a great part. That's my, when we, that's like one of my guitar players, favorite sections of something that we do live. He's like, yes, I love that solo. Yeah, but that's a fun part. <laughs> Understandably. And that also is a great example of what I love about Neil as a musician is just like what I mentioned about Phil, that's the breadth of, of everything that he does. There's so many colors and flavors and textures. Um, dynamics can really make, a uh, drummer, a great drummer. It's the speed, off times, really fancy fills. Those are all extra things, but dynamics, timing and right. dynamics will always make a great drummer. And I think that song's a great example of that. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Now, now I was just, have... well, if I can make. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, to just make a quick mention in Limelight before we wrap up on the, the Neil thing. Um, we are featured on, there was a, an official Neil tribute CD oh, called wow. The Stars uh, Look Down. It's got a nice tribute written from his sister on the inside. Oh, wow. um, and Limelight was uh, lucky enough to be on this. So it, it goes to charity research as well. So The Stars Look Down, um, it's a great charity uh there's a couple of uh, volumes they're actually going to do a third volume as well wow. so many rush fans please check that one out yeah what is the charity do you know off the top of your head it's going right to the um to the libostoma um and i don't know if i'm saying that well properly uh, foundation okay. and um so that's and it's all you know there's all proceeds go to that and um let's see yeah uh yeah, glioblastoma foundation uh, there 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 so make sure i get it pronounced a little better folks and um there's a bunch of great rush tribute bands on there from all around the world awesome look that up folks is that the first volume or second this is the second volume there's uh, there's um there's a third in the works and um so it was kind of a neat, neat little parallel yeah um the, the cover is blue we are the first song on the second volume, and it is Anthem, just like Fly By Night being wow. Anthem and Neil's debut. So yeah, that was kind wow. of a fun fun little parallel to the Rush universe. Absolutely. That's fantastic. Congratulations. That's great. Now, we have a video of you playing, and you know we've talked about your influences and all that. Ah. You're playing someone else's original material. Talk about what you do with Joe and let's show everybody a sample of your oh, playing sure. as you. Well, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I, I almost forgot about that. Thank you. Um, sure. Yeah. I uh, also love, I mean, I love, you know, as we've mentioned, interesting, busy music. So I've always kind of kept myself busy with a lot of work doing sessions that are progressive or instrumental rock. My buddy, the Joe Guerreri project, Joe Guerreri's, um, an amazing guitar player. He works also with Disciples of Verity that features Corey Glover from uh, Living Color. Um, and he also works with an up and coming band called Swim the Current. They've got a couple singles out right now. So Joe Guerreri Project, we do some a lot of instrumental fun shredder rock. And oh. uh, yeah, a, a few months back, we performed at the Chance Theater up in Poughkeepsie, New York. And this is a piece of uh, one of Joe's originals um called serotonin sunset and uh yeah some real fun some real fun stuff there where i mean he, he writes some amazing material and basically just gives me free reign to kind of do what i would like to do underneath it for the most part that's awesome well let's check that out here's an example of lou putting some of the elements we've talked about today of his influences into his own style of playing let me make sure i click on the right there we go here it comes right about <laughs> Now. <laughs> Oh, 
<laughs> wow. That snare is megaphonic, man. Jeez. Thank you. How I love thank it? you. It doesn't look like exceptionally big or anything. It's not. It's actually yeah, it's a six and a half by fourteen. Um, it's um it's an it's an RCI acrylic. The um when I was we were chatting the other day, I was talking about the uh the moon dust drums. Um you'll you'll hear more about those in the future. Um that is the moon dust acrylic snare. It's six and a half by fourteen. Um half inch thick shell actually i think it might even be a five eighth or a oh, eight, wow. half inch or five eighth um it but it's just it has the tone i fell in love with that snare the moment i unboxed it and got it from romano and the guys at rci it just it's a beautiful i mean it's stunning to look at there's there's a video on my youtube channel um but send, it's send it to it, me. Uh, wow it yeah. is it, it it sounds so good it's so versatile um it, it to me it sounds you can get the acrylic sound you can get the steel sound you can get that wood sound wow. and it's just uh yeah i'm using I'm using a remo black dot on the top and um and and just a regular snare side yeah and it just kind of came out of the box sounding like that that's awesome <laughs> when we're done grab the link and put it in the comments with a note of referencing the last clip um, Great, and, thank you. And, and folks, it's in there if you're seeing the replay. Uh, check that <laughs> out. That's outstanding. So I had one more influence, but for the sake of time, I'm going to save it for the next episode okay. because we also didn't get to show a couple of your clips. So maybe five was too many. What was I thinking? Um, <laughs> so we, we will be doing this again, unless afterwards Lou says, you know what? I just can't put up with your ass and we don't do it. <laughs> Otherwise, watch for us promoting that we will be doing this again. And we want to include you folks too. So feel free to drop a link in the comments of you playing something that influenced you. And there's also a link in the description of how you could submit videos to us and tell us you want to be featured on the under the influence show. And next time we're gonna each have a bottle of bourbon to live up to the name. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> uh, there you go. Everybody, thank you so much for following Lou Calderola and myself here on episode one of Drum Talk TV's original series, Under the Influence. Sign up for our newsletter, new one coming out very soon. Uh, there's a sign up button on the Facebook page and uh, we will see you all soon. Thanks.